Okay. <laughs> Greetings again. Now, you don't know, I, I deleted something, but... You know, since 2002, I prayed that I would not put up a bad word, either written or uh, spoken. And I guess at that time, I didn't know what bad meant. Bad doesn't mean making a prediction, as long as you say that, you know, you don't say it's El, you know, from El Shaddai, necessarily, but every prediction will ultimately come true, but you know how timing is. A lot of people make predictions and then, well, one day it'll be true, but the, 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 we can say, okay, I predict World War Three. Well, we know one day that'll be true. We know that's in their plans. We also know it's biblical that there will be another world war. And we also know from the book of Revelation, we know how much depopulation, how successful they will be with depopulation. And when I worked out the numbers in, well, this goes way back to 2002, 2003. But when I worked out the numbers, um, I could make a case if you compounded them, okay? If you compounded them, in other words, took a third of humanity killed, and then you took a third of what was left, not, a, not keep taking a third out of the total that was there, but a third, then another third out of what was, you know what I mean, and then another third progressively. Um, now, let me explain that again. You take a third, then you take another third, that's two thirds. You take another uh, you know, another percentage um, and uh, of that original total, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke when I, when I, I eh, account, I'm not an accountant, but I did work out the numbers and I got to 91% um, of the people killed upon the earth. 91, that's 91% 91 killed by my um, math in the book of Revelation, taking it progressively uh, and, you know, uh, and I'm not going to go back to the accounting. I gave it a word back then, and those of you downloaded it, you have it. It was uh, going by the scriptures and perhaps taking a little bit of interpretation with a third of the sea, you know, where it says a third of the sea killed. And um, we are um, also assuming that means, you know, humans as well. Uh, Anyway, you add up all the numbers of all the deaths in the book of Revelation, and no, but not including, I'm sorry, not including the great feast of the Lord, which is Revelation 19, okay? That's the aftermath of the fall of Babylon chapter, where the kings of the earth and all who serve them and everyone who's part of the world system at that time will be killed. And if I add that up, there would only be a, a very small population left. But before you get to that number, because most people serve the beast and in the day of judgment, on, on that judgment or death day, on the day of death, um, which is more accurate than saying just judgment, on the day of death, uh, the people that perpetrated all this on everyone will be slain by the supernatural power of the Lord after they have accomplished their deed of destroying 90% of the population. After that. So they will oversee a 90% population reduction. It's actually 91%. If you, if, you, know, you do the math a couple of ways, you can get from two-thirds or 66 and two-thirds percent, or 666. <laughs> and you can go from there to 90%, and, and that's debatable. And, I'm, and I will admit to you, it's, it is, you know, it's, it's, uh, that's a gray area in terms of mathematics. I mean, you can make a case, but in no way would it be less than 66.6% of the actual Earth's population killed by World War III and its aftermath and all, all that's going on with it. And, you know, in addition to 
totalitarian regime, people slaughtered for their faith, you know, just throw that all into World War III. And those of you who are very conservative, you would be fine in standing on that 66.6. .6. Of course, that's poetic, isn't it? 66.6% .6 of the population. But in my mathematics, and that is getting Rima from the scripture and then, and then adding this in, I get another 30%. Not 30, actually, it's, uh, see, yeah, not quite 30%. I get about 25% more, okay? And I've been, and I've talked to people who are experts in the Bible and, you know, and, and they, they, that's all they do is stuff like this, you know, and they've, they can make an argument either way, but they generally don't disagree with me when you, when, when you sit down and do the math and perhaps one day we'll do that, but this is not, today's message isn't about the math, um, you would say that, gee, a heck of a lot of people are going to die, aren't they? And yes, I just rolled out of bed because this, this thing that's coming today is revelation and it was just burning and I did four to six hours of, I think it was six hours of audio that didn't make it and I've just been so depressed over the world situation, especially the last about 24 hours. And... It's taken a toll on me in a way. I, I just, you get that feeling of inertia, like, well, what's the use? You know, we're all gonna die anyway. Look, look, at, look at what they do, Lord. Look, look how they're successful in bringing this whole thing about. Look how they don't care about people dying in our embassies. It, it's just, part of what has to grease the wheels to get this thing done. Look at the blood lust of the president. Look at the people around him. Look at them all demon possessed and not having any conscience or souls. Look at all the dead walking around making decisions for the rest of us. Look at all the success and nothing but success as far as the eye can see. I used to say to the Christian, well, to be Sold out to Jesus is, is to be prepared to die. Well, that's the way the world thinks about you. I mean, that's, well, not in this country because they say Jesus but serve the devil in every church, coast to coast, that has a 501c3 moniker. That, I'm not saying they don't do good work. I'm not saying there aren't good people there. But they are in the system and... Uh, as the Lord said, you have to, in Revelation 18, come out of her, my people, and be separate. That refers to the 501c3 or commercial churches uh, because it's owned by Babylon. And if you're found there, you'll, you will, you'll burn in hell. That's why we really don't want to see that. You will be counted with the kings of the earth in the day of the feast of the Lord in Revelation 19. That will be your basic church person. Don't care how good they are. Don't care how charitable they are. Don't. It's not about how good you are or how good you think you are, how many good works you've done. It's a legal issue. It's got nothing to do with, you know, what you think about your friends and your worship session, how many you were crying while you were praising the Lord and thanking him for, you know, allowing you to continue in Babylon and at the same time have church and how you're covered anyway because of your faith in Jesus and gee, nothing would happen. I, I met a guy, actually I have a friend, who said that, Zeph, if you're right, I'm gonna commit suicide. And I was told by every ch church that I am wrong in my, in, in my Rima and my revelation because it's not interpretation anymore that I'm absolutely wrong in my interpretation of God is no respecter of persons, that I'm absolutely wrong when it comes to uh, counting a, uh, and, and you know, this doesn't just apply to churches, it applies to all institutions and all guilds and all secret society where there are guilds and all apprenticeship and everything that is tied to Babylon. It, it's not, you know, the church is one thing, one of many things tied to Babylon. It's not an exclusive Christian problem. It's all religions 
and all institutions and all um, um, well, how well, how can I call it? All uh, going concerns that um, breathe and exist and are beholden spiritually. And what that means for an institution is to be, uh, the word is connected. And what that word connected means that if Babylon didn't feed it, it would not exist. And then someone would say, well, yeah, well then, I guess 100% of the people are going to hell and Jesus is moot. And, the, and, the, and I'd say, no, you're, you're not hearing what I'm saying. You're not hearing what I'm saying. You're trying to do numbers on salvation, which is, is ridiculous because what that has to do is it's, it's really a heart thing. I mean, in, in other words, they, they have a mechanism in the institute. And, and you'll just have to forgive me for sounding a bit forceful because it's, I, had to, I literally was yanked out of bed in the middle of the night to do this. And it's been brewing for days. It's just, but you're getting the wrong interpretation of my, of what I'm saying already, and I can see that that's happening. So I'm going to, you know, arrest that. Uh, I'm going to clip it before it gets going. No, I'm not saying that. Uh, salvation is a matter of the individual, and of the individual heart. And no one really knows. You know, I know that if your God is Babylon, that you will burn. I mean, I. You know, it's pretty simple. I know that if you know that the Lord has given you a choice to be separate or to be connected and, and to be with him would be to be se- to allow him to separate you and justify you and establish you with him rather than on the other side of that line, that you would be saved. And if that call occurs and then you don't go with the Lord, but you say you're saved, you're not and you will burn. I do know that. That's a legal matter that only the Lord knows really your heart. But that is the circumcision of the heart, and I suggest you go look up uh, Paul, circumcision of the heart, and go read that, because that will explain it to you much better than I can. Okay? The circumcision is really a almost symbolic of the circumcision of the heart, or to be made separate, holy unto the Lord. It's, it's um, <laughs> just, just an aside here. They're, they're now in New York City, decided as of yesterday, to vote to regulate uh, spiritual or Jewish circumcision, um, which is just another, you know, one of thousands of signs of the times. You know, just just another great sign of the times. No, you will not be able to do a... We do not consider one of your most sacred rituals to be sacred anymore. <laughs> and uh, oddly enough, it's secular Jews who are bringing in this law. So what do you... <laughs> There's just nothing I can say. It's so far, I can see, that's the kind of thing that really depresses me. You know, it really makes me feel bad to see something like that happen. Because I understand the spiritual implications. You may say, that's no big deal. Well, then to you, my friend, nothing is a big deal. Nothing. Everything is uh, profane. And nothing is a big deal. And nothing means anything. And there are no symbols. It is what it is. Because you're dead. So you can just turn this off right now. I, there's no point. It's just a waste of your time. If it, When everything becomes everything, you're dead. I remember how pop music was pushing everything is everything. Um, you know, like that was a cool statement. All that means is you're dead. <laughs> you know? And how many dead are walking around? Well, Congress, let's see, um, the Vatican, uh, um, the military, um, well, uh, General Motors. <laughs> I think you understand my point that salvation is for the individual, not institution. It's, there's no such thing as collective salvation, a group salvation. And so you're trying to hang me, you legalist fool. You're trying to hang me on this idea that everything is bad, going to hell, because I said something about the institutions. 
And I said something about depopulation. Many people that will be killed and depopulated will be with the Lord. Many is a word that only leaves you guessing. <laughs> guessing about a thing you really ought to know. Well, no, we, we do, don't know. No more than Satan knows the numbers on his side. It's not over till the fat lady sings. And now that that's out of the way, and you understand I'm going at this as a lawyer, as a, as a, as a legal argument, then you will shut up and listen. Because you're going to die. And how you die is probably, you know, it's, it used to be the Satanists were just pining for the, you know, just rubbing their hands together with glee, just waiting for the Christians to be taken out, just hoping the scriptures are fulfilled and that guillotine comes in and hoping they can be the one to pull the lever. Do they hate, do they even know who, who the person, no. It's something in them that makes them want to do that. Well, right now, those people, their God is, you know, they have a triumphant God. They have a, you know, um, you, you know, we can go through some of the, uh, the aspects of their God, but they're collectivists, communists, sodomites, uh, witches, um, abortionists, whatever. But it's the same group that... Um, his, the Bible's written about from the time of the beginning. They're worshipers of the flesh of themselves. And um, what God has done is when something gets so corrupt that, you know, they worship dung as uh, mana, okay? When it gets that backwards, um, the plug is pulled and they're killed and they're, they're done away with and the civilization collapses and disappears, doesn't it? And isn't that what's happened throughout history? Decadence just means that slowly, because of the wickedness of man, because of the basic makeup of man, slowly he will come to worship his anus as God. You know, slowly he will worship dung as mana. Slowly he will come to want the plants to grow upside down into the earth, you know, and call it good. Well, that's genetic engineering. Slowly he will, see what I mean? He will become that backwards one on every level or like sex can only be uh, between a man and an animal I mean, or between a man and a man or what anything other than what they think the Bible says or whatever everything would be backwards okay it's got nothing to do with sex at all that's it's like it's got nothing to do with um, defecating it's got nothing to do with throwing up it's got nothing to do with bodily movements but when those are worshipped including blood sacrifice in order to appease their God, which is the collective themselves, God, Yahweh, will eliminate them from the earth. But, and, and that's a supernatural intervention that occurs. Um, and, and we don't even need to, if you like, it'd be just as easy to say, look, they did themselves in. And you'd be perfectly right, because God is not separate from within ourselves. So yes, they're, change to self-destruct. And if you want to put it that way, I totally 100% agree with you. Now their prophecy, that is the Illuminati, is through, um, you know, the masonry, which is the top level of that is the Illuminati. So within those secret societies, um, of which every member of every Congress and monarchy worldwide is a member, and beholden to, and must do as they're told. And there are no exceptions to that anywhere in the world. If there is, there will be a, a you know, an assassin nation. Or <laughs> so, they have planned the, the, the war of World War III, and, you know, I've been going 19 minutes, and it sounds like I'm rambling, but I'm really just getting, you know, things set up here. It all has a purpose. So the purpose of World War III is depopulation. It is the thing needed for the purpose of bringing in what, they, what, what everyone's been fantasizing about, the New World Order. Well, the New World Order, you don't exist. You're not part of the New World Order because you won't be here. 
to be a part of anything. And that's what the New World Order is. It's 90% of the population dead. You can see it in their uh, murals of, uh, at the Denver airport, if you like. You can see it. And death is a combination of, um, you know, military um, weapons of mass destruction, plague, and various diseases that can be launched, including nano diseases, that can be launched um, at any time uh, when, as the war escalates. And everything that you're seeing today and all that you're seeing in the Middle East, and all that's driven me to a state of depression because I see that all the events that you see and the reason you don't see any reaction from the president is because he's part of the planning process along with the, you know, I mean, he's part of he is a, a brethren to George Bush in that they are brothers in the same secret societies. You, you know, the, he's not anything other than them. They're the ones who trained him. I know, you were thinking I was all political and you know, vote for Romney and I was just off the case. But no, no, I'm not. Uh, my, I was, let me put it this way. I'm also trying to make the best of a bad situation and get you some more time because there's a lot of you that need more time or you're going to burn. So I'm always going to ask for more time and do what is necessary to get more time because I don't want to see you die for real, the second death. I'm, I'm not here for so much for the people saved. I'm here, you know, for anyone who's interested in life, in living in being an eternal being, in, 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 in throwing off this curse of limitation and death and actually being able to live. But you see, this situation, when a civilization gets to the point we're at, it will self-destruct, and they have called for it in their prophecy with Albert Pike, calling for three world wars, of which he said the third world war would be, you know, a depopulation. And then the people that perpetrated it will be killed after that. And he, and he even mentions that. Figuring he'll be exempt from all that. And then their small cadre of uh, leaders and reincarnated uh, powerful uh, ap apotheosized beings or whatever will rule over the new Atlantis Earth and the people here will be basically genetically engineered to be their servants. And, and that's, you know, how, what, you know, and the earth will be their playground. And that's what they, it'll be a time of, um, in their minds, of celebration, not hard labor. It'll be a time of partying, if you like. It'll be um, the celebration of the end of their work over thousands of years, beating God. It will be the culmination of all the things that they've done throughout the ages that will finally pay off at the end. It will be the Armageddon bypass. And of course, in order to get this done, the idea of secular atheistic communism must become the way, and then you know that leads to mass death, of course. And um, communism is World War II, and World War I were about spreading communism throughout the world. And, um, and that has been done in the United States internally by people making it cool to be communists because they're all working together to bring about this result of their own death as they worship Dung calling it mana. And that's why they need to be rescued because these people are so deluded that they would just shoot themselves in the head and say it's good. You know, I mean, that's where they're at. Um, you know, as you, the zombie apocalypse, that's where they're at. <laughs> not, not even knowing that it's not even about what they want to make it about. You know, like the DNC platform of uh, basically um, gay marriage, abortion, and no God. That's their platform which is, of course, sad and pathetic 
as they are, but it's not the issue. They just want to deny there is an issue, so they want to talk about um, sodomy or something. They want to talk about killing a fetus after it's technically able to live on its own, which is, I guess that's their favorite delicacy. And this is horrible. And, you know, and then all the, all the progressives on the Republican side are in there nodding and winking at them. They're all working together, obviously, because there's been no progress in terms of repealing anything. Certainly no Republican has ever uh, repealed the sacred right of abortion. And anything that deals with death is lauded in the society. And um, all the musicians and artists are rewarded when they foster in mass death. It, what everything is about, and let me just focus you right now, what everything is about is mass death and depopulation. That is the issue right now for you to think about. It has nothing to do with um, I, I get, animal rights, gay rights, this right, that right. It's got nothing to do with anything like that. It's got nothing to do with capitalism versus communism. Communism is just a, a mechanism by which they can get what they need done done. In other words, to de, they need to um, de-link people from God so they can't pray and so they can make sure God is neutralized or whatever. And they actually think that way. But God is going to allow them to be successful and use them at the same time because this isn't about our lives. This isn't about finding ourselves. This isn't about uh, how we feel about something. We really have very little to do with it. This is about a bigger picture involving creation, not personal um, fortitude. It's a bigger picture that is more of a legal issue than it is um, a personal argument for a personal feeling of good or bad. One of the problems that I have with liberals is that Everything's based on feelings. So they never, you know, so they, they embrace Islam because they feel like that's okay. But then they, 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 um, they're, they're for gay rights, on the other hand, and, and radical Islam is Sharia law, they're for that. And they say, if you're against that, you're a racist. And they're for gay marriage, which, of course, in Sharia law, those people would be killed. But they don't think it through logically because it just feels good to be contradictory and hypocritical. It just feels right. And then they, you know, what they do is blame it on everybody else when something goes wrong. And that's what I don't like about them. It's very hard to be in a room with someone like that. They can hang out with each other and they do so very well. Just like Satanists uh, usually end up uh, blaming everything on everyone else as well. And uh, they may not be politically bent in that way. They're all over the map politically. But a Satanist is hard to be around because they come up and smile in your face and tell you how, how lovely you are, how great you are, how wonderful you are, how great to be around. And they say nothing but flatteries while they're sticking the knife in your back. And they have to stick the knife in the back because that's what Satanism is. It's about sticking the knife in someone's back while, while you know, uh, loving them to their face. That's Satanism 101. That's how they derive power, by doing things to innocent people who are not wily enough to know the way the game really works or have any street smarts and lead the, the, the poor fool to slaughter. And then they, do, they try to do this to each other as well. It's harder, though. And when everyone goes satanic, then the day of death arrives because they all have to be wiped out. And they will all be killed. And they will all burn. And they don't care. They don't care because they don't think beyond today. They don't care because their consciences were seared so they are sociopaths and psychopaths because that's where the path of Satan, conformity and all that, it leads to psychopathology and sociopathology. That's where it leads because the whole purpose of that spirit is self-destruction of that which is created period. And they have been planning this and, you know, putting it to pen and paper, I mean, in the 1800s and on. But this has always been the plan. But the most modern plan of Albert Pike 
involves three world, world wars, which will lead to depopulation, and then I suppose they've interpreted Revelation 19 as the people that perpetrated, whom they call the destroyer, the destroyers will then be killed because no true believer, in other words, the communists, the Islamics, whatever, who helped to bring about a mass depopulation in World War III, they will, when, they're, when that job is done, and this is in perfect satanic style, they will be sacrificed because there's no room for an Islamic anywhere in the New World Order at all. And it's not about that. It's a secular, godless New World Order where they, the, where each participant is the, themselves a god and eternal and has already achieved a form of apotheosis through, through transgenics, which is what's going on right now, just behind closed doors so you don't see it. But the idea... Yeah, they already have all that and space travel and time travel and, you know, those who are initiated into the higher degrees get to see what that's all about, but they have to, they're sworn to secrecy upon death. So that's why no one talks about it, because they would be killed the next day. Even on deathbeds, they don't talk about it, because they don't want their kids killed in retaliation for having to then cover it back up again, which is a big hassle. So the apotheosis ones, or the gods who are returning to earth, aren't coming from out there. They're here. They're coming from within technology. This is all part of it. I'm telling you, this is all in the works. And um, as I said, they have a, a bizarre interpretation of, they believe the Bible. and they, they're, they, they're, They've just gone at it also as lawyers to try to figure out the path to the goal because they, they understand that God is not a personal God. God is no respecter of persons, but it's like a chess game. If they can just get to that checkmate, which they already have a path to get there, they feel they will achieve their goal. And of course, we know that you can't beat God. I mean, we're not, that takes hundreds of years of inbreeding to be able to finally convince somebody of something so absurd as that you will have a, in other words, you'll legally tie God's hands. He cannot lie so that he must honor that. And, and the, the, the proof I have already is he already has in his word 91% depopulation. So they've already got that and permission to do that and they won't be touched. No, no one knows the time. But I would be, like from here on out, as I've watched the Middle East, it's really obvious to me that this is all about World War III and that Obama doesn't say anything because he's part of the group with a bunch of other people that, you know, you thought were good presidents and guys who are part of a super secret organization that um, has been right on track to bring about this result. And... Lately, they've been completely successful 100% of the time in everything they're doing because the people either, I don't know what's happened to them, but they can't see. They're blind. They're being led like sheep to the slaughter, but they can't see that, it, that all the moves they make are their own death. They think somehow they'll have a deal in this new world and they don't understand 91% depopulation. That's a lot more than just undesirable Christians. So I will intone the famous um, uh, parable of the uh, wise and foolish virgins here because I think um, the idea of being keeping the lamp oil going is uh, probably a good idea. And when I say lamp oil, I mean know who you are in Christ. Know what you believe about God. I don't mean storing up food. <laughs> on that day that I'm talking about, believe me, trust me on this, the living will envy the dead. <laughs> Preparedness. Um... If 91% of the people are going to be killed, then preparedness kind of like becomes a moot point, doesn't it? 
I'm not saying against it. I mean, you know, don't be stupid. But I mean, you know, I, do you think you're going to live forever here on Earth? No. At some point, you're going to die anyway. So, you know, and that could come more quickly than most people. When they die, they they're not ready yet. They have more that they want to do, including getting right with the Lord, getting right with their Maker, getting right. I have seen people before death reject Jesus specifically and try to embrace God. I've seen that. And that is a, um, and already knowing Jesus is the Savior. You see, it's really coming down to war against Jesus. I mean, he is God. People don't realize that his, his name means he is God. You know, and not just salvation. He has many, you know, his name is huge. He's, he, his name is the Word of God, for example. Okay, He's the Lamb of God. He is the, um, um, uh, uh, it's really hard to put it into words, but I mean, he's, he's God and creation kind of intertwined in, in, a, in a sense. I mean, he's a, he's a name of God that means also all events and all things that have been created or contained within him. So, Anything that is not found within him or an agreement with him, just like in a body, will reject cancer cells and different things that's healthy and it will reject what shouldn't be there, right? With antibodies. Those people that are not found in um, changed and renewed, you know, found transformed, if you will, are, um, it's not personal, but they're just not there. They, they, they're, it's like seeds that kind of started to get going, but they didn't, so they were plowed under, and, and there's no thought of mourning the seed. You, you just like, ah, uh, you know, a farmer plants lots of seeds and lots of stuff and focuses on the crop that's coming up, right? Not mourning the seeds that, oh, well, gee, they didn't make it. No, God is no respect to a person, and it's not personal, it's impersonal. And that's what's so hard for people to understand. It's... God wouldn't do, see, if we get everybody, and here's a typical Christian Mason thing. If we can get everybody on Satan's side, nod, wink, we don't say that, but you know, if we can get everybody over here, then God wouldn't kill us all, would he? And that's one of their famous, that's, that's a famous, um, gosh, I can't, I can't attribute that to a person, but I'm, um, I'm, I just want to say, behind the scenes in secret societies, that's a huge, huge understanding they have. And I would call it a misunderstanding. Because the answer is, yes, God being no respecter of persons would kill you all. I, you know, yes, all the people that say they're Christians, a billion or two, would be killed, cut off, and plowed under as if they never were. And it would be, nobody would lament it. Nobody would think another thought of it. Sorry, you would not be remembered, nor would anyone care. You see, and that's the hard reality that people have in, in understanding actual reality and the legal issues involved, rather than what you wish for or what you hope for in your feelings, because your feelings are pretty much betrayers. What it is, is that, and if you want to look at it really the way it is, is God is allowing you time to, to birth. You know, to give you enough time to come to understand what this is all about so that you can live and birth. The devil comes along with his own version of that, which is, you know, uh, backwards and about the flesh, not the spirit, and says you can birth the flesh through perversion and then be one of us and then and have your birth. And to God, that is death. And those people will be eliminated, never having been in the first place. Indeed, they are not even now. And they would even say that in their cryptic languages and poetry. They'll say... We are, but we're not, but we are. And that's why we have supernatural powers. You know, this is a bit esoteric, but this is, this is the way they think, and they do have supernatural powers. 
That is one of the temptations to unleash the flesh. And they do believe that they, they apotheosize into a god and they do believe they're eternal, but they're also very much involved in transgenics to bring about clones that they can occupy so they can live forever in their consciousness. In, and they also intend to bring people back like Albert Pike to be the king or whatever. And they do, they're very active in those kinds of endeavors as well. It's kind of a, kind of a blend of science and witchcraft. In fact, everything they're about is about what I just said. That's all they think about and that's all they do. And their plan, and it's not personal because they don't care either, is to eliminate, you know, I'll just put it this way, 90% of the population or 91. They'd even like to go further, but, it, you know, I mean, there's a certain number that you can get to that's somewhere between 66 and two-thirds percent and 91% that'll probably be more, you know, the actual number. But whatever, it's a, it's a big number. That means most of you who hear this will not be here. And neither will your children and neither will your parents. And it won't be so much, hey, look, because I mean, I know the Christians are all waiting to have the guillotine in the square and then have to line up Will you renounce your faith in Jesus? No, off with his head. Waiting for that when it's going to be more like mass death, just like a, hosing it all down with death rather than just this kind of drama because Christians tend to become Christian-centric, like it's all about them. And that's ironic because in Christianity, it's supposed to not be about you. <laughs> It's supposed to be about Jesus, right? So if it's about Jesus, then it's about God. If it's about God, it's about creator. If it's about creator, it's about the creation and his, his creation and his movements and his way. It's not about you, ever. Yes, it's great to have agape love and uh, I hear you. It's great to have agape love and take care of your fellow man. I mean, that's... That, that should go without saying, though, shouldn't it? <laughs> do you do it for show so you can show people how beneficent you are? Well, then you have a real problem. You're on your way to death. You, the, if the ego rules your life, you are dead because that's yourself as God. Now, the Zen people have tried to get rid of that ego forever. You can't get rid of the ego. The only thing you do is have the mind of Christ and have the heart of Christ, though you're still a sinner, and that's as good as you can do, period. What the Zen people do, and I've seen this, they sin and then they cover it up like they didn't do that. And then it's like, wow. But then again, so do all religions. They try to appear good. And, you know, the truth is none of us is good. So when you see the reaction of Washington, in other words, not only just arrogance, but a complete could care less attitude toward diplomats being slain. Whereas in 1979, when this happened under Carter's watch, the world was up in arms. America was up in arms. But you won't see the media, and they're not even covering it. You know, they're covering enough so you know it happened. But the media and everyone else will cover it up because they don't think it's good for Obama. And Obama, to them, is their spiritual leader. He is the number one... Um, you know, I don't want to be crass. There's a lot of words I could use and then that, that's just going to get me in trouble because people don't understand the context of the word I use and then later on they, you know, they try to paint me as like being a certain thing or whatever. So now I realize I have to use neutral words. But he is the, okay, just, just to, among other things, he is the abortionist in chief. Okay, that's, that's his highest right, one of them. Um, he's the gay president-in-chief, he's stated that. That's another sacred right. See, the gay thing is actually a sacred right. It has nothing to do with um, it feels good, do it, or anything like that. that. I mean, to the people, that's what they may think, but it's, it's a path, it's a journey. And it's a path to power as well. So he would be the head of that. 
Then what else is he? It's like the Pope, okay? So he would, uh, I'm just saying that these are his spiritual signatures that, and these are the sacred rights of, of his people. And um, he would also be the uh, assassin in chief, okay? Bloodlust. And that is <clears throat> kind of like the abortionist in chief. It's the same thing. In other words, th these are the worshipers of death for power, money, etc. Um, and he's not alone. His group put him in there. And he's just the, the, he is the high priest of what I just said. And uh, the high priest of no God, but using Islam as his police force to bring about the secular um, destruction and World War III for the purpose. And that's why they just got done building some sort of bunker underneath the White House. It was really because it's in preparation for this uh, event. And I believe the trucks have gone now, but uh, no, no one knows what it is. Just look up secret uh, building project White House and you'll see that they just finished a mystery project which took about $48 billion, apparently. I may be wrong on that figure, maybe it's $4 billion, but I mean, some huge number. Um, were they just updating their electronics and their you know, continuity of government? Yeah, maybe that's all it was. But I mean, it, came, it caught my attention as in part of this whole scenario. So, 91%, Book of Revelation, they will be successful and the point of legal contention then, it, no, they believe God's word. So they, they're, this is all, it's like a combination of chess and lawyering, okay? It's not personal. But no, I know you don't like being killed and, you know, and just, right now you're an afterthought. You're just like, you know, um, I hate to put it this way, but you have a big opinion of yourselves like we're the body of Christ or we're this. No, no, let me explain something. In this scenario, you are dog meat. You are an afterthought. You're garbage that needs to be taken to the dump. You don't exist right now. On paper, you're already dead. You know, in their, you know, scenario and consciousness, you, the, the, your fate has already sealed. The only thing they can't do, and this is, this may be one reason you may get some more time than you think. The one thing that they must do, and what the three world wars are for, is to ultimately, and this is something hard for them to understand, it's to eradicate God from the earth. It's to eradicate the sun, which is God, from the earth, and to bring their own sun in. It's to eradicate Jesus from the earth and any hope of salvation from the earth which they used communism, atheism, secularism, the enlightenment, whatever kind of you know things there are uh, to convince people that there is no God and of course there is no devil. Most Satanists don't really believe in a guy named Satan, they just, they, they know the spirit you know, they want to be possessed by that powerful spirit, the most powerful. They, they know it's there, but really it's, what can you do for me? You know, if those spirits are out there. Here, you want to possess me? Will that give me more power? Come on in. I mean, that's more the way they think. It's about them. It's about gratifying their flesh. And the things that gratify their flesh, money, power, sex, whatever, or the greatest perversions in the world being able to get away with them, it has the greatest orgasm factor or whatever. That's what they worship. They worship bodily movements and things. And whatever gives them the most pleasure, the most whatever, become God, becomes a spiritual universe. Hey, there's a little bit of that in all of us. You know, you can certainly see that if you were given the chance to be one of them, and you have, when I say them, I'm talking about people that have been inbred and um, bloodline uh, since the creation, <laughs> I'm talking about a lot of work. No, not just a couple hundred years has gone into this new world order. It didn't just come up. This has been the plan from day one, from Adam on. The question has been, when is, when is God going to allow, when is the restrainer going to allow it to occur? And, and, and you're hearing this is also the context and timing of this. Is now, you know, 4.35 a.m. And we've been going for about 49 minutes. 
the hour, the date, the time of this is also a part of it. It's all a part of it. So there were hours that didn't uh, go up because um, um, they just couldn't, I guess. There was plenty of good things said. I mean, there was a message to pastors, for example, that um, you'll be held responsible legally for what you, you've done with your flocks. If they're found in the Babylon world system, it will be your head that will roll. You know, things like that. And it didn't go up. Well, I just said it now. But, but see, a statement like that, that's like, but we already know that, right? I mean, any of you pastors who are sneaking a listen here, um, you already knew that, right? It's a legal matter. It's not about you. Nobody cares about you personally and what you think or feel. I know that we anthropomorphize God when we pray. It's like our father and it's close and it's like family and it's like, because that's what we can relate to and that's how God wants us to pray. But, you know, it, th th there's a purpose for that. But you can't personalize this whole thing of like, I don't feel God would do that because that would be an evil thing to do and he's not evil to kill all these people. Uh, and I give you a pastor that's in den denial and he won't look at the legal matter because it, he, will, he will even say in his sermons, God is no respecter of persons, but he doesn't mean, you know, he means he's no respecter of persons if you don't follow along the bouncing ball that he puts out there every Sunday. <laughs> he doesn't mean God, he means himself. He's the last one that should be a pastor. And if I were you, my friend, I would resign today to, in order to save, you know, maybe your family, if not yourself. Oh, I know you won't do that. You know, a guy like you would have to be forced out. But when you see the things I'm talking about come to pass, do this for me. Apologize to your flock before they die. Do that for yourself, at least. Explain to them what you've done. Yeah, that you had a pact, and then one day you were going to take care of it, and you, had, and you enforced the group to be like you. And your job was to be like a policeman over them. And then you did this homina homina thing with God. And you've done this for 35 years. You're, you're a despicable psychopath. I don't care. I mean, I am just saying, you know, you be whatever you are. I, I'm, I'm plenty bad myself, but I'll just say this. You want to live? And do you want to kill your flock? Most of you by that age, you want to kill your flock too because that's the spirit that's in you. You want to kill them. You want them to go to hell. And your argument is, Jesus wouldn't kill us all because we worship every day. We got Bible study and we do all this stuff. And my God, of course, he's not evil. So don't worry about it. Our sins are covered. And you'll put it in that context like you've done for 30 years. And then, and then you'll be wrong. You needed to tell them there's no collective salvation. I mean, it, churches all believe for some reason, you know, they don't state this as doctrine because they don't want to be blasphemous or her heretical, but they sort of do believe in collective salvation. Now, I'm talking about the Roman church and, the, you know, the big institutions. You know, they do believe that if you're a member of the church that you'll be saved. <laughs> and if you do what you're told by your priests and your pastors and these people who are put there by God, you will be saved. And they also believe if you're not, like, look, I've had priests tell me, you know, you need to become a member of the Catholic Church or you're going to go to hell. <laughs> and I've had that told to me, I don't know how many times. But, you know, there's a lot of snake oil salesmen out there in the form of priests and politicians and other end salesmen who are out there selling, you know, all kinds of garbage that doesn't, uh, you know, like a pet rock. That if you don't have this pet rock, you're gonna you're a nobody. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of mythology out there. They'll try to sell you to make you feel better about your stupid life and my stupid life, our stupid lives. 
And, you know, realizing what our lives really are is really depressing to me, you know. You know, I love the Lord and I love the Word and I love Jesus and I love, uh, you know, I even love them. Them, not, not the thing that's in them, but them. What they were before they became whatever that is. Of course, we're all the same in, in that regard. We all make choices, you know. We all have to live with those. Oh, I hope they will repent, but the Lord already told me a few years ago the doors were, you know, of the ark were shutting. I take him seriously. You know, I don't, I don't think there's, gee, you know, how about a little fudging wiggle room? No, I say, okay, Lord, uh, how do you want me to deal with this? In other words, what it means is, it's got nothing to do with him, by the way. You know, it does, but it doesn't. You know, everything does, but it, it doesn't. It has to do with the fact that the people who have made their decision on what side they're on, and you can see the, this was a prophecy. It's come due now. You've seen the, uh, on the political scale, which is like a physical manifestation of the spiritual reality that we're talking about. You've seen the hardening of the lines, haven't you, the last few years? And the prophecy was given a few years ago, and then the lines got hardened, and there's no, there is no way to communicate. There is, and the lines are harder every day, which is all part of, you know, that, that, and this also is prophetic, because when you see that happen, prepare for war and prepare to die. The lines, the, the, the twain, because it used to be when I was younger, when I was young, that, um, you know, there was, you know, you know, in politics, let's say, we'll use that as our working metaphor for the spirit for now. There was collusion between the left and the right and deals were made under protest, but there was a general kind of consensus that would keep occurring and budgets would get passed and things like that. This prophecy wasn't just about the United States. The United States is simply kind of like the, the head of, you know, the thing that's rotting. You know what I mean? It's all rotting, but the U.S. is kind of like in the, in the foreground, but it's the whole world we're talking about. And uh, so there would be a, a time where the decisions are made and the twain shall not meet. In other words, those who choose one side or the other are going to harden their hearts and positions and there, there's going to be no change. And what you've seen on the, on the political level and, and on the political scale is um, the same thing that's happened on the spiritual scale, although the spiritual scale has already been accomplished. So now you're just getting the manifestation of what's happened in the spirit. In the spirit... The doors were shut, but what that means is the decisions were made, the positions are solid. And there is no, you know, that's, it's lining up because we're coming to the end of this situation. So it's lining up. Those on, you choose this side or that side, but those choices are in cement. And then you're seeing it now everywhere. Cats and dogs just can't live together, but you're seeing it everywhere. You're seeing the outward manifestation, which means that a few years ago in the spirit this took place. And now a few years later, we see the outward manifestation of war and impossible, no negotiation. And when that happens, we go to war. The form could be civil war. Uh, the form could be uh, uh, you know, global war. The form could be covert war, which we've, we've seen where they kill us behind the scenes when they don't tell us. All the above, and even more ways, you know, alien invasion or whatever, you know, name your manifestation, but all these are manifestations of what has already occurred in the spiritual realm. The war will go forward, and 90% of the people are be, will be dead. And the rest of the mop up, the great feast of the Lord, will be, in other words, the Albert Pikes of the world, who you think are getting away with something, they're next. 
so that all of them are dead and everyone who helped them are dead and all their secret societies are killed. Gone. All of them. But, but, the people of the Lord in the very end and the witnesses and the resurrection and all that that occurs establishes the real new world order and, and it's even the earth is made new which becomes a different dimension of e eternal terms. And so all of this just becomes about birth and the friction there, therein that tries to uh, prevent birth. In other words, you know, you need a womb to have birth. You need a birth canal to have birth. But it seems like for the baby to come out, a trauma, a real pushing and, you know, just the tearing of things, of, of, of flesh and bones and all that has to happen, friction against to try to prevent that baby from coming. It's almost like the mother is needed, but she's almost trying to, not voluntarily, but that her body is almost trying to prevent the baby from coming out. And at times that's what it seems like. So for every birth that happens, a great deal of uh, uh, resistance against, but eventually the baby's born because the force of birth is much more powerful than the force of death. And um, so every time you see a birth, that's why they like abortion so much because it's, it's stopping that process um, before it can occur which is the ultimate right. That's why you're never going to see, and you never have seen in this world, abortion ever. It's been part of the world for thousands of years as the ultimate right. Now, they even have breeders who will have premature births. No, no there was a, the last trimester birth so the child can breathe on its own and then kill it in a ritual, you know, a few hours later. Uh, although that's not really necessary anymore to have, you know, some sturm and drang kind of like, you know, some theatrical robes and all. I mean, they, they do their pomp and circumstance, but it's no longer necessary. In the secular world, all that gets done under the veil. And people don't realize what they do. They don't understand that this over here, abortion, you would think that any kind of semi-intelligent person would say, gee, the very height of the, of the political platform is abortion. You would think that that would, should be a red flag if someone would say, huh? And start working it through what it means. But people don't, have been trained to say that the, the actual reality of our world, which is the spiritual dimension, doesn't exist, so they don't have to work back what it means. So everyone's lost the meaning of what anything means. So there's, you know, that's the last stage before slaughter. All they have to do now is get the world war going and uh, they'll be able to kill off 90%. It won't matter. Muslims, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, atheists, you're all going to be in the same boat on that day. I know. Some people are thinking, well, what about the two witnesses? And what about the mark of the beast? And what about this? And what about that? And, uh, you know, timing is everything. Uh, well, first of all, the book of Revelation is not linear. It's kind of like you should look at everything in there as, well, all this has to get done by the end. And this can go in stages, too. Did you know that, for example through abortion and through the tampering with the environment that the birth rates are going down. So you can count those as deaths. So they are being successful, you know, so that process of depopulation has actually begun. And it's actually been going on for years and years. So, you, you know, it'll never be like a, a kind of like a, a, you want to see a two hour movie of the book of Revelation and they've tried to make them and they turn out to be hokey and corny because that's not at all what the book says. For example, if you take Revelation 7 and 14, you go, gee, that's two events. When does that happen? And some people have like false raptures and then the real rapture and they have all kinds of theories. But the document was written out of time. Sorry. No, it wasn't, it's not, a, it's not a, a temporal document. It's a supernatural document and it will never behave the way you want it to behave. You go, well, God is not the author of confusion. It's like, no, 
I'm not confused. I know that I can't take it as a profane document. That doesn't mean I'm confused if I can't make it profane and put God in a box like you want to do. That doesn't make me confused. That makes you a fool. No, I know, I know. None of your friends would ever say that. So you're the, you're the big shot. Don't worry. I ain't going to be usurping your power because I could care less. To me, you're just another person. Just like I'm another person. Just like the guy over there is another person. There is no status. Your job as a, a pastor, though, is pathetic because you're supposed to shepherd the people to the Lord, not to yourself. Oh, I know you don't think you've done that, and now you think I'm talking about someone else. It's fine. I've gotten to the point where I just don't care. You know, you guys are going to do what you do, and you're going to just try to argue with someone like me or somewhere else and say, you know, and then you'll finally come to the conclusion that if I'm right, you're going to commit suicide. Okay. Um, there is no way to talk to you because you've already made up your mind. You think... You think that you're right. You've proven in theological seminary that you're right. You have proven that the real deliverance of sinners to the Lord means that if you believe in Jesus, you'll be saved from the wrath of God to come. And you will live eternally with Jesus in some faraway kingdom without people that, you know, who are against you or, or some such. You feel that love covers a multitude of sins and so your position legally is covered under the moniker of sin and not spiritual position. In other words, it's, it's, you have it figured out that we were born in sin, so whatever we do, whatever oaths and affiliations we have, in other words, let me be very quite, 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 quite razor sharp clear on this. Whatever affiliations we have, whatever memberships and oaths we've taken since we believe in Jesus, that's all covered under sin, including even serving the world system, which is you know, technically believing in Satan as a savior. But, 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 but let's get back to just the legal matter. Um, believing in uh, a thing you call the world as a position to be in, but that's covered under the sin uh, agreement uh, with Jesus and the gospel. So it's okay, everything's cool. So therefore... Get your flocks to conform themselves so they can make lots of money because that's the reason people do that. So they can make lots of money uh, so that your coffers will fill and so you can build more stuff and have a million dollar house uh, and whatnot. You know, it, 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 it's all very subtle, but it's a legal matter. Um, oaths and beliefs are not covered under the sin doctrine of the gospel. Did you know that? So that, yeah, but God wouldn't kill us all, would he? I mean, that's a lot of people. Well, how many is it? I don't know. I'm just speaking le about the legalities. I'm not, I don't, I could care, I don't care about the numbers. One person is too many. A million is the same as one. What I'm talking about is your heart. What comes out of a man's mouth is what comes out of his heart. And that's what defiles a man. And um, if your position is blasphemy of Christ through your affiliation and connections, and then you go claim Christ, 
that that's your real belief, that he's the son of God, therefore you'll be saved because you believe your legal argument is covered under the scripture that says you'll be saved if you believe. I have news for you. The most hardcore Satanists in the world believe in the son of God. And they know he's the savior. And they have rejected it as such because that's part of, you have to do that in order to have a ranking there. That's part of the initiation process. Okay, so you're no different than that. Legally speaking, I mean, you may want this and want that and care about people and go on missions to help starving African babies live and, 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 and you may do a lot of wonderful things in your life. And I'm sick and tired of wasting time here talking to people like you at the moment because we have a lot of people that just need to hear what's going on and they don't need a lecture about the legalities of cheating, which is what it is. You're, and you're encouraging your flocks to cheat. This is that simple. It's like being in a James 4 4, you know? It's, you're, you're, you're being an adulterer. You do not have fidelity um, to be, you know, when, the, when you speak, the world understands you. When I speak, the world does not understand me. If you were more like me, when you speak, the world wouldn't understand you either. When they speak, that language does not, I mean, it gets me really depressed, but it does not communicate with me. Because you see, the twain shall never meet the positive charge cannot be connected to the negative charge on a battery, or what happens? Right, the car would blow up. If you leave your screwdriver there connecting the two, it'll start a fire. It will destroy the car. It's one or the other. The Laodicean church, as spoken of in Revelation, really just kind of, you know, is sort of like the Pergamos church and, 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 and the Ephesus church, you know, that, that all have you know, Babylon is the head. You know, this is well spoken of in the first couple of chapters of the book of Revelation. It goes over the um, churches and it also shows how Jesus pulls people out of there. But when you hear the Bible talking about pulling people out of something, like in the book of Jude where it says, you know, pull them out of the fire with fear. That is exactly what I'm doing now. You're in the fire and you're going to burn and there may not be much time. So the idea is, Fear, that is, I think the idea of mass depopulation would um, probably get under your skin a little bit um, if that was an imminent thing. And with that fear, Jesus can literally pull you out of any kind of connection. Because what does it matter in death? Who you're connected to, what the thing is. It doesn't matter then, right? You don't have to make any more money. You don't have to provide for your family. That's all that's out the window. <laughs> so what do you got to lose? But it's sad that um, this one obscure podcast has to talk to pastors in that manner. That is really pathetic. I mean, I'm embarrassed to have to even be standing here doing it. I, I, I'm only doing it because it's come on me pathetic. It's come on me in the spirit to do it, and I don't want to do it, but it's, there it is, and so I guess the Lord wants it, but I, it's, what a commentary, I mean, what a, when, when Christians pray in America, you know, it ought to shake the foundations, right, no, no, when Christians pray, nobody cares, <laughs> no change occurs, it doesn't have them quaking down there in Washington, they're not quaking down there in the courtroom. When they get together and pray, nothing happens. Oh, yes, it does. We had healings, we've seen this, we've seen manifestation. And you're just lying now. You have a demon. You need to be delivered. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've heard all that. And um, I don't really care what you say because you're, uh, everything you say is tainted by your position. So no one should actually listen to you for any reason, but they're, they're, they will continue to listen to you. So, it's okay. I, you see, the Lord, I got very depressed because I was shown how one person in a million are the same. Yes, the Lord would allow five billion people to be killed of whatever faith. 
it's not really, you know, like he's separate from it. it you know, from the very beginning, death was a part of life. Not looked upon as some awful thing, but just a part of a process. The idea of man was to be like a physical manifestation of God that God would take care of and, and there'd be an eternal walk with something that was manifested in the physical that could then give worship and praise to the creator from that position in the physical that couldn't occur just in the spirit like that. Now, I'm speaking plainly about this because I... You experts out there, you, you can put it in fancy language, but I'm just going to speak plainly about it. So God created, you know, us be, so he could receive love, praise, and worship, and so he could love, praise, and so he could love and be loved. He's actually just, we're just like manifestations of him. You know, um, reflections of him. And uh, it's, um, you know, kind of a beautiful thing there was you know I'll be your god you'll be my children you know there's always references to children you know being a father to the children that's what he wanted I'll put you in this treacherous earth cuz uh, it's all going to fall because I'm I didn't make it perfect for a reason so that I could deliver my people out and so that and 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 so this is why I finally understood that this world isn't about this world this world is about birth that we're not yet born. We're, you may be born again uh, of the spirit, meaning that you know we're sprouting up, you know. But really, born can't. The, the life and death here in this plane is part of a birthing process of being His children. He'll be our God because that relationship is eternal. So this temporal thing we're going through of the of flesh is just a process of the birth canal. You know, you think you're alive, you think you're living, but this is really a dream world compared to the real world that you'll experience um, after death, which is really birth, which is bizarre, but that's the reason the world seems so effed up is because it's, it has to be that way for this birthing process to occur, otherwise it wouldn't occur. So that's why it's exactly the way it is. And so the instructions come forth to those attentive ones that this is the way, this is the path to birth. This is the path, in other words, to life. And those of you who hear that understand it's not about ethics so much. Not necessarily, you know, I mean, you know, uh, it's not really about, you know, being good. It's not about behavior so much it, it it's because everything's going to behave the way it does the way it's programmed to behave it's really about a path and and it can be explained legally because god is you know the judge is really no respecter of persons it's like if you broke the law you go to jail if you didn't you you go free it's really not personal and um, we tend to, again, personalize religion so much that we think, you know, we see images of, you know, love and caring and charity and, and goodness and those kind of things. And, and, and Paul really stresses those things more than anyone else in the scriptures about what that would look like, about brotherly love and compassion and caring and, you know, forgiving when the other guy is hurting you because you're waiting uh, you, because you're trying to love and, you, you know, and it's really for real and your hearts have been changed and all that. But, you know, even on your best day, you're going to flip out once in a while and it's, you, it's never going to be exactly what you are. Unless you're dishonest, which, which is another trait, which is another part of this process. But in the courtroom, dishonesty is called perjury. And it's not honored. There's a penalty for perjury. There's a penalty for perjury. There's a penalty for um, deception. There's a penalty for um, doing evil to others. 
there's a penalty for allowing yourselves to be convinced through intellectual processes and teachers and mind control that what the Bible says didn't really say that exactly. It really means this. And then when that lie is perpetrated, whole flocks go down. And would God really cut them off? The answer is, of course he would, because it's not personal and it's not about them anyway. This is probably really hard. You know, it's hard to think of God as an impersonal, um, not human-centric, uh, no respecter of persons entity that that has a process we don't understand and we're caught up in it thinking it's about us when it's not really. It's very hard to grow up on that point and understand it's not about you. And then, you know, that you cannot earn your way through what you think are charitable acts, even though there might be good karma coming your way, and you might have more of an opportunity to get to the truth, or maybe more time in your life to live, or maybe, uh, you know, who knows? Uh, uh, there's plenty of good people in the early church that were just thrown to the lions. They didn't do anything wrong, and they were plenty charitable, and they loved each other. So, you know, there's no guarantee there either. You know, and because of this, people get so angry with God, they just rebel and say, you know, screw him because, you know, he doesn't really care. And my friend, on that point, you're right. He doesn't care the way you care about your children, say. It's not the same thing. He allows us to have this fantasy that that's the relationship because that helps us to become what he wants, which is birthed, which means to be separate from and then leading along through the canal, meaning let's just say your first separation from the world would be the sperm and the egg getting together and creating cells. And the journey is ultimately to birth. And as those grow into a fetus, you know, you're going down the path, which had you stayed connected to Babylon, uh, you would not be... Um, there would be no intercourse that would produce an offspring. So therefore, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the recognition of Jesus and the dying to self, all that is part of the German, you know, I'm, I'm trying to put this in these metaphors and it's not really working out, but you, you know what I mean. It's all part of that birth process of impregnation and, 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 and birth. That has to, that's what Jesus called being twice born, you have to be born again, meaning you've got to, there has to be some, you know, it's really odd about Jesus. It's talking about this great feast of the Lord and this great, um, um, rather this great consummation. But, you know, I'm here to tell you since, you know, we might as well know the truth. The consummation takes place before you're even here. But it's written in terms of a linear temporal thing because we do that so we can understand. But that's just like, so a baby can understand you have certain, you know, blocks, A, B, C, different things so they can understand and they make up their own stories and you help aid them because in those stories they're able to understand and learn. So the, the reality doesn't take place in time at all. And so the consummation of you and Christ has already occurred, but it occurred in you know, that this world's almost irrelevant because it's, it had nothing to do with this world. It didn't even have anything to do with the decision process that you might have ended up making. And, but since, and I don't want to talk about that necessarily because it's important that you are here and that you receive instruction on how to get out of here. So it's important that you, you know, otherwise you'll just fantasize that you're not here, nothing's real. It's like the film The Matrix. So I'm just like floating around um, amorphously and nothing, it's very, you know, it's, it's hard to deal at that point. So I can say that on the one hand about reality and the other hand I have to pull it back to that, you know, practically that you are here and there is a path for you specifically here. And yes, your father loves you. It's just, you can't comprehend his love because you're still a baby. You don't, com you don't really comprehend it, but you will. That's part of the birth process, that you will be able to comprehend 
the Father's love and your love, you'll be able to comprehend your own love, which I would argue right now that humans don't understand what love is at all. Rather, they have glimpses of it or a feeling of it once in a while, but really it's so incomprehensible in this stage of life that we're at that we would have to grow to be able to, to be able to um, have it fill us, let's say. Otherwise, it would just burn us to a crisp since love is really the only thing that's really going on. But it has so much baggage, the term love. People think, oh, smooch, smooch, kiss, kiss, or oh, I love my child and I just got a new bicycle or I just you know, hugged him or I took care of some poor people. Whatever it is, you think that there might be a glimpse of love, not manifestation, but love is not comprehensible to the human only in metaphor glimpses because a human cannot, does not have the capacity to hold the father's love yet because he has to be birthed, has to exist. That's right. We, we're, 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 we're barely in existence even now. It's not all about this. It's not all about, all about the earth. It's not all about us. It's like being in a fairy tale. And we hear about this apocalypse. And we hear about 90% of the people are going to be killed. And we hear about this horrible things to come. But, we're, but it's, a, it's a fantasy story in a way, though it's real. It has nothing to do with what's really going on. But then again, it does since you believe yourself. You look in the mirror, you say, I exist. And boy, it's awful to die. And I just saw this ambassador die on TV. And boy, that was bad. They suffocated him and they raped him and they did all this stuff. And Obama didn't care and the Congress doesn't care. And they're nodding and winking because they're getting on this raid for World War III. And you all are being just led to the slaughter and it won't, doesn't matter what you think about it either. As Led Zeppelin said, crying won't help you, praying will do you no good. When the levy breaks, you pray all you want. Not going to happen. So, the Lord will raise up, you know, fools like me every once in a while to tell you something, to get you to consider something. And I suppose, you know, I probably overcomplicated this whole thing, which I tend to do at times, but. It's only because my mind wants to comprehend God and wants to comprehend reality and wants to comprehend love and wants to comprehend what existence is all about and why I exist. I want to comprehend that. But it's not relevant and has nothing to do with a legal argument for life and the instruction we've received in order to live, which is, and let me summarize this, A, in order to live, you must be born. I think that's probably a pretty reasonable proposition. The, the, the metaphor of birth, as a, you, you know, in pertaining to this life as a womb, would mean that birth would occur after death. Right? To be absent from the body is to be present with the eternality of the Lord, with eternity, which is God. So, um, my argument cannot be refuted. Two, or B, um, in order to be alive or to become alive, one must belong to the creator and the creator must belong to that person. Um, there has to be a relationship there. And, but the, you know, one of the factors of this life is that the the distant amorphous creator out there um, had to come into the flesh himself to take the punishment of the rebellion and to then become the redeemer that any who believe would be saved. You know, the gospel. The good news is through Christ you can actually live. And what does that mean? Baptism is the act of separation from the world, and it's also an act of obedience to God that you're willing to publicly state um, and publicly be separated from the world system, which is death. 
and you're willing to take the risk through public baptism of death for your disconnection. I mean, let me put it this way. I'm now, forget A and B. Uh, let's just do this. If you do not sow to the world system, they might just kill you. Because they frown on that. That is the very thing that must happen in order for you to be baptized and baptized in the Spirit and born again. It means you're disconnected from one thing and connected to another. Or if you like, um, the consummation uh, of the Lamb has taken place and birth is on its way. Pregnancy has occurred. You know, well, I could put it in a million different metaphors, but the point is that without that, there can be nothing. There is no birth. Um, can someone do it without Jesus? We'll say, well, um, if they did, they did it with Jesus, even if they didn't know it. Okay? And that sort of uh, gets you out of this God's evil argument. I mean, there is no separation technically from Jesus Christ and anything and anyone. He's in all. So if anything happened, salvationally, he did it. And it may not be according to the rules of a religion called Christianity, but somehow it happened. And that sort of gets out of this exclusivity argument or anthropocentric false argument that you've got to be a member of this church or this group or this thing or this whatever, or it, it doesn't occur. It simply is this. God chooses his people. You have the choice to accept or reject because without free will, there is no love. So you have the choice to accept or reject. And there is also the deception of thinking you've accepted when you've really rejected, which is called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which means twice dead, which means doesn't happen, which means no birth. And um, so you can have the guy, yeah, you can have a guy who thinks he's a Satanist actually get, I mean, this is an extreme argument, but you could get a guy who thinks he's a Satanist born again and someone who thinks they're squeaky clean going to hell as a Satanist. You could have both extremes and I've actually seen both of those things occur, which is the most bizarre irony of all time, but it, it does occur. Man will always try to um, destroy himself if left to his own devices. And he will also always turn against God and, and because he wants to be God himself because that's within man. And that's why Jeremiah said that the heart of man is um, deceitful and wicked above all things um, because at the end of the day, man will want to be God and be worshipped as God which we've seen with our sports stars and politicians and rock stars and entertainment stars. And, um, you know, it's not, it, that's a pretty common thing of vanity. And va the vanity of um, self-worship will be uh, moot, uh, muted. It will be as if it never was. It will not exist in real reality. Um, that doesn't mean that someone that people say is a narcissist won't be with the Lord and go on to eternity in full birth and in full glory. It doesn't mean that. A guy like that, the people think is a narcissist, could, where the, the, the people think this, is, this one's a saint, might not. That's why I'm not broad brushing the thing, you know, and in every group of people, including other religions, uh, atheists, scientists, politicians, every group there is, there is a certain percentage of people that are one way and another and there's really no way for me to calculate. I only see one person and I see five billion people and I think the one in the five billion, the Lord shows me, that to him, they're the same. I know that's bizarre and that's a really another hard reality. You, you see, people thought that they could get everyone to conform to the devil and tell them they got Jesus. And that's been the trick they've been using, that bait and switch thing. They've been using that from the very beginning of time, using religion to, to enslave people. And um, 
the argument being used is, God wouldn't kill all of us, would he? Now all you have to do is go in the book of Revelation, check out the uh, letter to the seven churches of Asia, and you'll be able to see how God deals with um, the churches. And you'll see it's a mixed bag. You know, I can summarize the whole thing for you. All seven churches have these things in common. Number one, except for the church of Philadelphia, there is uh, all kinds of um, efforts to get people to um, you know, worship Satan as God, including Satan setting up his headquarters there and taking command of the word to deceive people into blowing it. But God will deal with the hearts and that Jezebel also, her job is to get people to worship her and not, you know, in other words, to enslave them into the opposite thing so that they are dead. It's the friction of birth. God will deal with the people that really want the Lord. He will bring them out of that situation, but they have to be willing to come out. Then later on in the book of Revelation, uh, in Revelation 18, it says, come out of her, my people, and be separate, which is also part of the Old Testament, that you won't be counted for the, the plagues that are going to be on her. You won't be with her, in other words, the Babylon world system and the, um, and the plagues to come, the, the destruction thereof. You won't be part of that. Instead, you'll be going on into the resurrection and then with the Lord. But you must um, agree. It doesn't mean you have to actually physically do anything. You have to agree that um, you're with God and not with them. And, you know, some people will be put on trial. And if they say they're with God, and that was, you know, the early Christian church, what they used to do, or the Catholic church through the Inquisition, is people that were of God, they would kill. And the people that would just go along and get along, they would let live. And they're a very tyrannical organization. But they, the whole purpose was to eradicate the people of God from the earth. So that's why the church was set up in the first place. I mean, it didn't start that way on day one, but I mean, that's eventually the purpose of the uh, institutional religion was to kill the people of God. And that's always been the, um, the purpose. And also, you know, to kill the savior should he show up again. And that's the purpose of religion. Doesn't matter what religion, but that's, that's, the, that's an irony that fits its mathematical precision and perfection. And that, yes, the church would be the one to kill Jesus. Yeah, the church would be the one to put to death Anyone who had Rima uh, would kill the prophets. I'm not talking about a flock that says they're with Jesus. I'm talking about people that have spiritual gifts, understandings, uh, revelations. The, the, those are the ones that religion targets. If you go into my, I'll prove it right now. You go into a church you've never been to before with a word for them from the Lord and you start to speak it. They will tell you to shut up, take your seat, be quiet, Go get, get, take some classes, and then one day you, maybe the Lord will give you utterance, but this is a, a demon that's operating you now, and you need to repent of that. And that's what you'll be, be told in most established evangelical churches uh, where prophecy is welcomed, let's say, among themselves. If you are a valid prophet and you go in there, they will just try to kill you. By shutting you up, but they will also ostracize you should you not meld or blend in with the uh, satanic ethos with the nodding and winking and, and secrecy of being a member of a secret society, but then being overt for Jesus and all uh, the. I, I, look, I have tried my whole life to understand. And I'll be the first one to admit that I do not understand, um, I do not understand. I don't see, but you know, maybe it's because I haven't had the life experience of, you know, maybe it's because I had a sheltered life. I don't know why I don't, I, it's, you know, I have, one guy accused me of having a vendetta I'm like, Vendetta, what are you talking about? Because I prophesy, I have a Vendetta. What the heck, heck is wrong with you? I have love. I don't have a Vendetta. I, it's, it's, a, it's a service. It's, it's not hate. It's not you know, telling people that 
the, the truth is not, it does not mean a vendetta. I have no personal interest, really, and because I, I know I'm going to die anyway. I don't have any interest in hurting people, having a vendetta, getting even with somebody. For what? This is the, this is the world we find ourselves in. You, you know, if I had a vendetta, you'd have to kill everyone all the way back to, you know, uh, Cain to get even, and even then you wouldn't be even. You'd have to kill yourself. So, uh, no, I, I, but, but see, when you speak to, you, the, the people that feel threatened by it, they're gonna say something like that to you. That's what a church would tell you. You're full of hatred, you're full of vendetta, you need to forgive, come on in here, become one of us, and everything will be okay. And then maybe you'll prophesy one day. If you go in there prophesying, they'll say, you have a vendetta, you hate us, and you need help, and you don't have the love of Christ. And they will essentially try to castrate you in that way. On day one, that's what would happen. On day one, that's exactly what will happen. So, no wonder so many of our brethren are turned off by church because it's a, it's a, it's a very hostile place um, if you are with the Lord. It's a very, very, very nasty place because you know, the whole purpose of it is to be disconnected from the Lord. And that's the best way I can put it. And I know they don't think that, they don't see the, that deeper implication. They don't, they can't work it through. They, they're blind. They can't see that. And I don't mean they're bad people, but you'd be surprised. Uh, the hostility that I've gotten from people who normally are kind of nice guys, kind of normal people, and how they manifest when they're around uh, me with this understanding, and they get a whiff of that understanding just through co a little conversation or whatever, they turn murderous, which then shows me that they're with Satan and not with the Lord at that moment. And I'm like... Well, you've just proven my case, and my case is before the Lord, and you have just proven that you are not for real, and you've done this, millions of you and millions of you, over and over again. My question, and this is what I don't understand, I'd really like to know, why do you go to church then if all you're going to do is hate people? That's a good question. If all you're going to do, and more specifically, if all you're going to do is hate the people of God, why would you go to church? One person said, because they need, they need to. They need the fellowship, they need the camaraderie, they need the group, you know, otherwise if they're lonely. And that's a good answer. That's probably the best answer of, all, of any answer, because they're lonely. And so the price to overcome your loneliness is to be with the group and this sort of collective consciousness. Otherwise, you're, you're looked at as a lone ranger Christian, you've heard that term, meaning you become uh, an object of hatred. That, that's a derisive term, a lone ranger Christian. There is not a real follower of Christ. There is not one of these people that's a lone ranger Christian. Not one, even if they're in solitary confinement, are they a lone ranger Christian. That's a hostile pejorative term designed to tell the group not to be free in Christ and to stick with the group rather than the truth. And these people will kill Jesus again just as quickly as he shows up, but he's not going to show up in that way. <laughs> the book of Revelation also talks about Christians being killed for their faith. Um, and shows the great multitude of the tribulation saints. These are people that are, you know, in, in, and people think it's like a big amphitheater, they're killed for their faith in a big dramatic movement of a film or something. It's, it's, these people have been being killed for their faith um, for their legal position from time immemorial, and they're, they're, the multitude's already there. <laughs> so... Well, I can't, you know, I know it's really difficult for you to understand and for me to understand, to me to talk in terms of, you know, um, eternity versus temporal reality that we're in. Let, let me just put it this way. The reality you're in, you can't trust. 
So when you try to time the Bible in this reality, it's never going to work out because it's not like that because time is elastic is why. You know, if there needs to be another thousand years for something, it'll happen, but everything else will happen on Q2. It, you know, there's layers to this and it's, it's just never going to be what you think it is because you're, you're still a baby. You can't comprehend it. And so, you, you know, even the, the way the Bible is written is written for children, for babies. It's not written for... Um, you know, a mature being that is a lot, you know, that is, say, like an angelic being wouldn't need, um, they, 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 they wouldn't need the Bible. I know there was that one angel that said, don't worship me, I'm your brother. Um, but I think too much is made of that to make it like the angels are like people just a little higher. Um, an angel is a different consciousness altogether and already is the Bible and is the fulfillment therein and, and holds, you know, they may not be the, well, I'm not going to get an angel versus human here because there's just too much that's been made of that. And then there's this whole anthropocentric thing where people start competing and go, yeah, but after this, then we're going to be higher than the angels. We're going to judge those, you know, and they want to, you know, they, they, they miss the whole, they, they completely shoot themselves in the foot as soon as you give them any running room. So I can't give you guys running room because you're just going to go do that. You're just going to intellectualize yourselves off the cliff, and then all the rima that you were given is going to be gone, eaten up by the birds, and your faith will not increase. You know, it's really, really, really simple. Death has come. You must be in the right position, i.e., remember the virgins, five wise versus five foolish, you know, it's just a metaphor. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. It's just a metaphor that you want to be like the wise ones who were already ready. Or if you like, where the Bible says, you know, you must be in possession of your soul on that day. On the great and terrible day of the Lord, you must be in possession of your soul. Meaning, you must be in the right legal position or else you're gone. As if you never were. Because this really isn't what we are in now isn't really <laughs> so you, you'll never to be as if you never were means you never will have been you never will have become in the first place you see the Bible's trying to tell you that but most people don't understand we are already in as if we never were territory if we don't live beyond this we are we never we actually technically never were in the first place God is not violated. His love and perfection are not violated because in reality, all that exists is of love and there is no sin and there is no, you know, thing like this. And it's okay to be as a child and, and think of, you know, God is your father and your daddy and Holy Spirit is your mommy and Jesus is your... You, the guy helping you along and incomprehensible savior and have break it up like that. But again, those are just crutches so that you'll be able to follow along. But what I find is that, you know, when you get real, something real from the spirit, many people can't comprehend it because they're still kind of in that baby talk stage and they're not able to really go to that next level. And like I said, you can't comprehend love. You know, love is manifested at times as charity, sacrificing yourself so a little kid can live, throwing yourself on the train tracks or whatever to get the kid off the track. You know, those kinds of things are like little indicators of something. And it blows us away and brings us to, what do we do? We cry. Yeah. And we moan and we wail and we carry a sorrow in our hearts because we see the opposite all day long. And then when we see something really good, it actually devastates us even more than seeing something really bad, right? And then we are to the point where we're beside ourselves and can't function. We're so blown away by the event of a, of, 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 of a guy, say, sacrificing himself so a kid can live, you know, whatever, that we, 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 um, it almost becomes a point of sorrow and a point of pain and a point of, and eventually what the Satanists will do is say, um, I hate that. 
what that person did. He should be, you know, I like him to live so I can kill him again. Or more cynically, yeah, the kid lived because the guy, uh, you know, was the blood sacrifice for our real daddy, which is abortion, gay rights, <laughs> and uh, perpetual war, and what else, what are the planks of this of this society? Um, <laughs> and and and, and uh, abortion is close to the uh, where the baby is conscious of being killed as possible. I got news for you. The baby's conscious in every stage of being killed. And that death is a murder in, in the spirit of things. But, you know, uh, we're all murderers by proxy anyway. So, you know, where there's blood all over our hands. It's only Jesus Christ that cleans it up through the fact that he was sacrificed, the lamb, for our sins. There had to be a, a blood sacrifice. God sacrificed himself so that we would live. But the, since we have free will, we'd have to accept that love. And since we can't comprehend what love is, except for these little glimpses, it's very difficult. At the same time, a child can do it more easily than an adult, which is, you know, choose this day whom you will serve. You serve Christ, the, you know, for real, it won't be like the churches you see. The church just represents the world. They'll hate you. You won't be cool. Cool is you've agreed to die, to be as if you never were, so we'll give you some perks in this Neverland world, this underbelly, uh, so you can be cool because you you're going to kill yourself, so therefore we're going to give you presents and trinkets and make you feel like you're a star um, because you've agreed to die. So you're not going to be any problem and you're going to help other people come to that agreement, so we're going to give you even more kudos. We'll do everything we can to help you accomplish your goal of killing yourself. And that's kind of what it amounts to. If you decide to live... Um, like birth, the friction of the birth canal and, the, and the, the forces trying to stop that birth from happening will be astronomical. Because you see, taken in personally, that birth, um, the goal of life, what we call life, which isn't really life, but what we call life, is to prevent that birth from ever occurring. Because we want to keep the status quo of death as our way. They killed Jesus because he represents, you know, life outside the box. You know, conforming to the way of God and not to the way of man. Man, by his very nature, is born dead in the spirit, and so his way would be the way of death. And, you know, because he has powers, he, the unwritten rule is anybody not lining up here you know, the, or like the Japanese like to say, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. And so it's just, that's just a process like that that goes on. And, and, and if you're dealing with the, the, the idea of birth, then the whole thing is basically uh, dictated by this simple fact. That is, what you call the known universe will move to try to block anything that has to do with life, birth, Rima, Jesus, God, Spirit, all those things, and true agape, which is incomprehensible, but it's... And all those things would be blocked in favor of a counterfeit thing, which wouldn't lead to birth, would not lead to eternity, would not lead to an eternal relationship with the living God. And, um, but it had to be set up that way by God in order for birth to occur in the first place. <laughs> because it's not personal. I know we personalize everything here. It's all, and then we, we care. There are people that carry vendettas. And let me explain something to you. That wayward Christian that told me that I had a vendetta, he has a vendetta against us. 
and he's simply projecting it. He has a vendetta against actually God. He's project he has a vendetta against the truth because the truth doesn't work. So anything that represents that, bam, hammer it down. I'm a real Christian. So, you know, that's the dilemma we find ourselves in. And that's what's been weighing heavily on my heart. I'm watching everyone do their part to bring about, I did not expect to get into one more legal battle in the courtroom here. I just, I am so sick of it. You guys, can't you people that listen just, just get right? Can't you just knock it off? Can't you quit arguing? Do you really, don't you see this as a waste of time? I came to tell you this today. You're gonna die, okay? It's not personal, which means that you're gonna be as if you never were unless you are. And there is no are or life unless you're born. And there's no born unless you have a relationship with the living God, which is through Jesus Christ. And the gospel is just, makes it possible. But I don't even wanna get into all the legalities of that right now. I believe that anyone that follows Jesus for, or asks the Lord what's true, will be given the truth. I don't care if you're in China, raised as a Buddhist, ask for the truth and you'll get it. And the son will show himself. And the son is the father. The father is the son, ultimately. Now, I don't think any Buddhist would disagree. They just have nothing in the place of the Lord. So it's a negation equals the assertion, which technically in man's backward mind, that could, could, could be, but it's the Buddhist tenet of of nothingness is not true, it's false. And the tortured logic of codependent origination of uh, some of the Buddhist philosophers is like Suzuki and so forth, is false. Or it may not be Suzuki, so don't jump on me on that, you, you Zen people. But, you know, it's part of a Buddhist ph uh, philosophy. Um, so it also became Nietzsche's philosophy. <laughs> you know, negation. Just negate that there is a God. In the negation, you have asserted that God is. If you say there is no God, you've just said he is, because he couldn't not be unless he was to begin with. Therefore, you have just proved the axiomatic argument that is always true, always true. Denial of a thing means the thing exists and will always be true. It's an axiom, meaning an axiom is never, it's not argued because it's just, it's just a principle that is like, you know, uh, you know it, it's not debatable in other words. It's an axiomatic truth that works every time it's tried, in every venue it's tried, among any people it's tried upon, they would have to agree. If you say there is no God, as the atheists do, they, they're some of the staunchest believers in God. That, in fact, they have more faith than most Christians, the atheists. Because their denial is so strong, it, it becomes tantamount to faith. They have such faith, in other words, in God, they have to move heaven and earth to deny him, and that's a huge effort on behalf of faith. Because if you didn't, if it really didn't exist, there'd be no need for them to get up in arms about it, would there? They, it wouldn't even occur to them, would it? No, they believe in God. Every atheist does. And say they don't. And in saying they don't, and getting so adamant, all they do is prove that they have great faith in God, but that along the way, they were disappointed in life and blamed God and became atheist. In other words, man will just deny something if it brings him discomfort. Jesus is a myth, God doesn't exist, the Bible is just fantasy, um, yada, 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 abortion is God, sodomy is God, uh, war is God, murder is God. I, I don't know, the, 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 what is the platform right now? Don't touch abortion, so that's one, that's, that's like the high priest is abortionist. And then sodomy, meaning that the, the, um, the, the gay rights, let's say, or marriage or whatever, would be a sacred right above and beyond, you know, say, marriage or, or whatever. So it, it's now in a pantheon. It is a god, too. And then um, there's a couple more, but these are the, uh, the credo of the, um, of the new world. And I'm here to tell you, um, to you people that, because um, usually, I mean, if a person, 
is for gay marriage. They are also the rest of it. They are for collectivism, abortion, and all the rest. See what I mean? You don't just get one without all the others. It's it's a it's a consciousness thing. It's a demonic thing. It's, it's got nothing to do with. Uh, f- f- first of all, I just resent anyone that wants to have a a decent philosophical argument about anything, focusing on some act of the flesh and then defining themselves as that. Right there, that is just such an insult to the person who insults himself. And and usually, when people are on that plank, then they're ready for death themselves and make it so that, you know, there is no way to argue it. It's just, it's sad, is what it is. You know, I can make a case right now that the world is about to commit suicide. Done completely by themselves and the the biggest adamant abortionists and, and I'm sorry, there may be gay people that don't like abortion, but usually they go together. Um, you know, communism, collectivism, abortion, gay rights, and no God. These all go together. And the lines are hardening, can't you see it in the news? You know, um, to me, gay rights might as well be animal rights. Animal rights are in there too. I mean, it, it's, it's not about gay or animal. It's not about uh, abortion. The, it's not about any of those things. All those are a total incomprehensible distraction. It's almost like you're contemplating your navel when, the, uh, when a boulder is about to hit you in the head. And you're wondering if you should be an any or an outie and what that means with your navel. You know what I mean? That's what it's like. It's, it, it's, well, I can't even go there because it would mean that the stupidest people on earth are people. <laughs> and I know that's just not true. So it's, it's a spiritual thing obviously. Um, there is no argument on that. I've, I've never in my life seen that not to be true. Um, it has always been true. Uh, the, um, the, the, you can divide people into two camps, that those who are spiritual and those who are um, flesh worshipers, which, or, or if those who want to live and those who worship death. And now the lines are being very hardened. The, 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 the doors have closed um, which means that people in general, doesn't mean new people coming up who are becoming conscious choose Christ, or, you know, doesn't mean there won't be more harvest. What it means is, it takes me years to understand this, it means that here's what God was trying to tell me a few years ago. What that means is, is that the doors are closed, meaning the people that have made their decision will not waver. They're going to go on to death with that into the slaughter of the 90%. So therefore, the book of Jude comes into play with some saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire. But not all. Televangelism is dead. No more need for it. It ended when people made their decisions. They're, the people that have decided for Christ, they're not going anywhere. They're going to go with Christ no matter what. They're, they're not going to waver. That's the good news. I guess you can, from this very depressing podcast, I suppose, you could take that away as something that you can feel gratified about that. But then, then the next question is, yeah, but who's really for real? <laughs> Only God knows. So then you're going to be disturbed again. But yeah, I have to admit it, the whole world has gotten me down the last couple of days and something was brewing. I guess this was it. And I just couldn't uh, put my finger on it. You know, I've decided personally that, you know, and here I am, you know, making music and acting like uh, got my whole life ahead of me like I'm 20 years old or something. It doesn't matter, you know. Uh, I... There's lots for us to do, and you should just do what the Lord has you. If you're on the Lord's side, meaning you're not on the world's side, and so you're probably having a hard time doing anything, um, you know, just do what you're led to do by God. You know? And um, God wants us to, to think in the now, meaning the eternal now, like there's all the time in the world. Like, in other words, don't worry about time or your death. Just do. 
And he hates it when people just sit there and do nothing because they figured it all out. So they're going to wait for the end. And I tell you, my friends, I don't know of more torment. I don't know of a worst situation in terms of self-torture than sitting there waiting for the end. I cannot even imagine how painful, because I don't do that, how painful that must be. Because when I have waking moments where I get to ponder stuff, I either have to do this podcast or jump into a pro do something, or I'll just want to commit suicide right there. I mean, I'll wish I was never born. To be there day after day listening to a guy say like Alex Jones, which basically what he, the whole purpose of Jones is to make you inert so you don't do anything. So you just sit there waiting for the end and tuning in for more conspiracy theories of how effed we really are. And this is what they're going to do to you next. And I, hey, I, you know what? There's a time and place for everything. And I've had my enjoyment from listening to Alex Jones and uh, just like getting around, you know, sidling up to the old radio and hearing how bad it is. I'm just like you. I've, I've done my share of tuning into that or I wouldn't know. But the net result of what he does, and then of course he has all his clones and we, all the other people out there doing the same thing, is, is uh, to aid and abet. This is ironic since he hates the New World Order. I know personally he hates it. But it's like the bridge on the River Kwai. He's assisting the enemy, doesn't know it. He's in denial. And then at the end... It'll be like the guy, you know, the bridge on the River Kwai where Alec Guinness, the men are demoralized and they just want to die and there's no morale in the, on the, in the in a Japanese prison camp and in Burma or whatever. And so they start building, you know, the, the Japanese commandant of the, of the uh, prison camp needs a bridge made because he's got orders that his uh, trucks are going to be coming and they need a bridge to cross over in like you know, within a month. So he's got to build that bridge for the troop, for the Japanese troops to, to attack and kill uh, Americans and what Chinese and other whoever else. So when they start building this bridge, so, so Alec Guinness is the head of the prison camp and he starts getting everyone interested in, you know, how would they, using American ingenuity, build that bridge? And so they forget about what the purpose of the bridge is. They just start building the bridge because it's good for morale. Suddenly all the men are getting up in the morning and sh shaving and you know, getting a good uh, attitude. They're, they're, they're taking care of themselves. They're getting to work. They're building the bridge. They're taking pride in it. The commandant is thrilled. There's almost like a little bit of a cooperation going on between the, the Japanese uh, soldiers and the Americans and Brits. And they're, so they're building this bridge <laughs> And the bridge is making everybody feel good, from the commandant, the Japanese, and, and all the prisoners. They're all feeling great about it. And then, which could only happen if they were in mass denial, right? Because they're building a bridge for the enemy, who's going to kill, theoretically kill their brethren. But they don't, they put this out of their mind because building the bridge is giving them a pop, giving them their humanity back, giving them you know, a sense of pride, a sense of purpose. So they really buckle down and build the best bridge anyone's ever seen. The most ultimate bridge ever. Showing just how superior that American and uh, British ingenuity is, let's say. Because there were Brits and Americans, in, in my recollection, anyway. And only at the last minute, the tr now the trucks are on their way. And... Um, you can hear the rumbling in the distance of the trucks. And that kind of shakes the, the head of the prisoners out of his delusion and denial. He goes, oh my God, what have I done? Oh my God, what have I done? You understand? And he, then they get in a shootout with the, with the, with the, with the Japanese, with the uh, commandant and the, or whatever, the, the, the commander of the prison and all the troops, because he's going to go, uh, uh, he, he, he's, gonna, he's rigged the, the, the thing to blow, he's going to go blow it up, because he, he, he can't build a bridge for the, the enemy to come over and then kill him and kill the people. So he goes, oh my God, what have I done? I did all this because it gave the men a sense of purpose and pride, and there were men, they were trying to actually stop him, some of his own. 
So he gets all shot up and finally he gets to the, to the, to the plunger for the TNT and he just falls on it and blows it up and uh, saves the day in the end. And the whole story is like a, uh, it's like a, it's kind of like a, uh, the structure of it's like a play. More, it's, more, it's almost more like a play than, than a movie. And basically it just is telling a story about the human condition. It's got nothing to do with the Japanese or the war or any of that stuff. It's talking about how humanity deals. We're all building the bridge for the enemy. We are all aiding the enemy because we have a sense of purpose. We're all wanting to conform, to be approved of, to have friends. Because it gives us a sense of purpose, a sense of life, a sense of, of success. We need success. And that very thing is the thing that's giving the enemy what he wants, our heads. Don't you understand? Now do you understand? Yes, you see, <laughs> that is what the brilliant author of The Bridge on the River Kwai was saying. It was a universal story of the human condition. And that's the condition we're in. And that's why at one time there were, it was almost a Christian world at one time. Because that was the only way that the bridge could be blown up. But the price of doing the right thing and blowing up the bridge, the guy lost his life. Even that was true, exactly true to the stuff of life. Today, I think if you screen that film, I'll bet you no one would understand what it was about. That, that's because we let the enemy in. And I say we, I've done it just as much as anybody else. And in terms of spiritual conformity, you know, I don't bow down to the devil, but I've done my share of conforming to what's cool, how to speak, what to think, I've done my share of, of being in denial and lying to myself. And all of you have too. We've all aided the enemy. So in that sense, maybe that'll give you a warm glow. We're all in the same boat. And when the death comes, I'm here to tell you that it's not going to be what the ego, the Christian-centric, I'll put it that way, put it nicer than ego-centric, uh, Christians think that it's all about them and they're going to be in the square and being executed. I mean, you know, that may happen too, but mainly it's, we're all going to die together, okay? It won't matter what your religion is. So I don't know how you're going to connect with God. My suggestion is the gospel of truth, which is God Word, Christ. It, but see, the Father has to, you know, make that happen for you. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't make you believe in Jesus. You, you wouldn't even know what you were believing in. You don't even know what it, what it is. I can't make you have a relationship with your creator that ought to be the easiest thing in the world. I can't make you see that there's a satanic uh, principality with all kinds of um, entities and being that want you to uh, be happy here and successful here and have a way for you to do that. I can't compete against that. That's, that, that seems like the right way. And what I'm saying seems like suicide, even though I'm saying you're committing suicide. And, and you know, it's Bridge on the River Kwai. It's the same story. And there was dissent. There were people that, that wanted to stop the, uh, the others from building the bridge. But it was so intoxicating and so empowering to build it that those voices kind of went to the wayside. Following Moses was like an act of suicide. People finally came to their senses and started worshiping the golden calf and Drinking and, uh, well, they didn't have plenty of booze, but they were having sex and free love and all that. And it's like, yeah, they were feeling good for a while. And that evil Moses came and killed them all. You know, they were going, according to some, the right way. 
they're here in life and they're gonna take a big bite out of the apple, right? Embrace it with all they've got. Do the best they can and be remembered after they're gone by their children. And I have news for you, your children aren't gonna be here. No one will remember you. No one will care. No one, that you will not even have existed in the first place to be remembered. Now, think about that for a minute. Think about the fact that nothing you've done was done. Nothing you thought or made was made. Nothing that you yearned for or detested ever occurred. No decision you've made happened. No thing that you've you've, you've, you've uh, thought or created was ever created. All there is, is your free will and what you're gonna decide. You're gonna build the bridge and keep it, or you're gonna blow it up. And the bridge basically is a bridge from your heart to the enemy who wants you dead and doesn't want you to live but is willing to, you know, make everything Disneyland for you should you go his way, her way, its way. And the other way that's fraught with obstacles that will be uh, seen as just throwing your life away. I, I've been told for my faith and my walk, and I, I don't have a real... I mean, the only thing, the claim to fame I have is that basically, um, I just hate things that are satanic. I don't know what it is. There's like a war going on. But it, even that's not of my own doing. I just have this, 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 this um, inability to cooperate with people. Could I put it that way? This, um, I had a need for people to hurt me. And the best way to get them to hurt me is just don't be part of what they're doing. <laughs> so, no virtue of my own, thank you very much. And then the other time, the, the rest of my virtues are I'm a sinner. And it's only through his grace and his love, which I don't comprehend, that I'm able to even say this much. And I'm not talking about being good because I'm bad myself, but I don't believe that God has rejected me. I don't believe I can earn my way into his favor by being good. In that case, it would be not cussing, not drinking, not smoking, and whatever else I do. Or whatever, or eating too much, or um, going and seeing a horrible movie. Or I, I don't know what else, you know. I, I don't really have that many conversations with people, so I don't get the opportunity to make lots of fibs or go into denial and say something that isn't true. That doesn't happen so much. It, I have talked to people that have told me all kinds of things that weren't true. And then I got to where I was agreeing with them. And, and those are very troubling. But, I, but if you don't have that many contacts, you know, with people via phone or in person, then it's harder for lies to get going. But it's not a virtue because if I were exposed to more people, I would probably become quite the liar. Because that's, that, that's a natural thing for humans to do. Oh, I don't mean telling people uh, lies. Like I, I'm talking about telling people like, oh, well, you know, in the context of religion, you, you know, I mean, a lie that would get you killed, you know, where you think you're saved, but you're not, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, yes, those pastors who perpetrate those lies, they will be dealt with more severely than any, than any Satanist or any um, mass murderer or anything like that, they will be dealt with a billion, billion, billion times more harshly than that. And they will be conscious of their punishment. And they'll be conscious of their... Because they got a lot of people killed. You know what I mean? I mean, how many generations have gone by and how many times have they done that? Then when the prophets come along and tell you the truth, what happens? Get rid of them! And get this lying bastard up there. Right? Because we want to hear about how great it is to work on that bridge. And how good people are feeling about themselves. And how successful they're being. 
having a sense of purpose and the nice spirited discussion at the dinner table at night and, you know, and um, really operating like a, like, a, like a family now. Good feelings all around. Uh, champagne and this and that. And no, nobody bummed out. No, you know, the only drinking and eating goes on is because celebrating just how good things are all the time. No heavy hanging over of a end of days or apocalypse or any of that nasty stuff that you know, you know, makes us uncomfortable. All we have to do is vilify anyone speaking like this as <laughs> losers and fools and uh, you know, we're right back. You know, and we're going to win the world for Jesus, aren't we? Come on in for the team with Jesus. And in that context, Jesus equals the death of humanity. And there's nothing I can do about it. The saddest thing in the world, but you know, it was sad watching him build that bridge, knowing. And, and but during the time they're building it, if you see the film, you know, it was filmed from the 60s or what, you know, long 50s even, a long time ago. You'll probably agree with them during the time when the men that are working on the bridge, they're feeling, you know, they're finally getting a, you know, they were. Believe it, they were just like death warmed over, wanting death. They were just sick and depressed and defeated as men. And when they started working on the bridge, they were alive and they had purpose and power and friendship and brotherhood and all the things we all say we want. No, no, they didn't have gay marriage. <laughs> but I'm sure there was there was that kind of activity going on, right? But humans are humans. Um, again, all these side issues like that are there to distract from this situation that I'm talking about. I think if the human being could enshrine murder and perversion as God, they would in order to distract away from the truth of this other thing that, that we're talking about. I mean, that, that is actually makes sense to me. And they would all go into a collective denial and anyone who tried to break the denial would be the enemy because they're having a sense of purpose. They're having a sense of worthwhileness in their lives. They're having their children. They're building their houses. They're driving their cars. They're going to work. How dare you? upset the goodness and the, and, the, and the success and the sense of purpose these people have because a new factory came to town and we're finally getting this economy back on track. Don't, it, we're recovering. Don't bring that crap in here now. And all they're doing is building that bridge for the enemy to destroy them. Ain't that the bitch? Isn't that just... So, you have got two choices. You can stay in denial. I'll de Here's what I got a lot in LA. I'll deal with that later. <laughs> can I just go ahead and take Jesus like at the last minute, they'd say. Why, you think the movie's going to have a different ending? Besides your death, your destruction, your irrelevance, your never having... Here's the scary thing to me. If someone told me, if you go that path, you're going to be as if you never were, and nothing that you do will ever be remembered by anything or anyone because this thing isn't going to be here anyway, meaning this, this earth the way it is right now. And that would make me think. I would stop and I would go, well, then what would mean something? But then again, nobody wants to... You get around a discussion around the table, kick around some of these ideas, you're going to get your apologists and they're going to stand right up and they're going to go, there is nothing wrong with being successful in this world. And my children will remember me. 
what I did for them. Or the greatest generation, World War II, gave us all our freedom. Well, where is that now, folks? Where, is the where are the fruits of the sacrifice of the greatest generation today? And this is what makes me really sad. Not in evidence, Your Honor. It's all been, all that goodwill and all that, all that effort has now been used up. All that goodwill around the world, used up. All that sacrifice that was made, it's already been spent. How can I live in a world where if I, if I believe in God or the Constitution or something good about this place, you know, there's plenty wrong with everything, but I mean, that the rights come from the Creator, you know, I can get down with that, that I never thought I would saw the day or see, I never thought I would see the day where making a statement like that means that you're a racist. I never thought I would see the day where the man would put his head so far up his ass that um, he believes he's reached the promised land. I never thought I would see the day where um, gay rights activists would embrace Sharia law. I just figured that in Sharia law, since they kill gays, that wouldn't happen. I mean, they wouldn't embrace Sharia law because... That would be, a, you see, never thought I would see something like that put publicly in your face. I never thought I would see the day since 1979 where when ambassadors are killed, the world doesn't care and the media doesn't care. Nobody cares. I never thought I'd see the day where people actually just don't care that their countrymen were killed. They just don't care. Well, if you don't care about a thing like that, then you're not going to give a damn about your own death either. And your own death is imminent. Imminent. As in now. The pieces are forming together for Albert Pike's great vision. For the Denver airport murals to come to pass. For the book of Revelation to occur, for, um, you know, the world war will expand beyond just conflicts between countries in Egypt versus, you know, in the Middle East versus Israel. Gog and Magog, Russia, Israel, uh, America, whatever, however your interpretation of that is. To me, it just, you know, war is hell. Um, I often wondered how in the world would they be able to poison a third part of the sea and this whole wormwood thing. You know, there's a lot of things that, that are part of this scenario, of this depopulation. A lot of things, I believe, that the, the perpetrators of it are counting on certain cosmological events as well to play into. But, you know, we're talking 90%. And we're talking still the fulfillment of all the book of Revelation, all God's word, 100% down the line, and all the two witnesses, and this and that, and the, the mark of the beast, and all these things you people are waiting for, like waiting to count it down. I'm just here to say your counting isn't going to matter when you're dead, will it? I'm sure they will have, they already have chips ready to go. They just need the right context of martial law. So people could be chip. it'll be, it could be something like this. In order not to go through the checkpoints interstate, if you want to drive straight through, just have your chip information ready and you get to sail through. They already have this on trucks, where the truck doesn't have to, they can weigh them, they know how much they weigh without having to stop on the scales, they just sail right through. They don't have to get in line at the, to be weighed. You have seen that? Through computer technology. So they get to just keep on going. Or people that buy a, a certain thing at the toll bridge, they get to go right through, they don't have to stop and pay a toll, they go right through. Or a, a chip. So when you get to the checkpoint, wow, you're okay, you go right through. Your papers, please, would just be the chip. I mean, it's like a no-brainer that this is, this will uh, obviously be, occur, and people may just do it for convenience. It's like, yeah, I just want to sell right through the airport. Well, with this, you won't have to go in that line and be shaken down and groped by Homeland Security 
With this, you get to sail right through. <laughs> so I can think of a number of ways to implement it. The point I'm trying to make is, you know, after days of being bothered by all this, I'm here to say that the Lord is uh, indicating to me that this World War III thing is really... No, I don't really believe the kickoff was 9-11. I think there's... It, it, you could say we've been at war since then. Yeah, you can say... Look, if you like, you could say we've been at war since the time uh, of the serpent in the garden. We've been at war since then. And, it, you know, you'd be right. There's been a war going on since then. So that, I'm talking about World War III. I'm talking about interruption in the Middle East. Russia, China, America, teeing it up. Nukes or whatever there is for nukes, whatever, that whole technology and other kinds of weapons, you know, being used. Um, the purpose of all that isn't conflict between nations, isn't even the conflict with Israel. The purpose is really depopulation of this one and um, an establishment of a new world uh, without you, without me, without everything that we've kind of taken for granted. And I know what you're thinking. Yeah, it's too big to fail. This, you, you look at all these cities and shopping centers and universities. And you're, you're crazy. Well, am I really? I'm just uttering what uh, the Lord showed me today. And so you do with it, with it what you like. But uh, what I'm going to do is live each day like it's my last. <laughs> and what, what would you do on your last day? Well, what I would want to do is I'd want to do something that um, I was led to do by the Lord. I mean, I don't really have anything on my own that I would do because everything's going to die anyway, so I, it's hard for me to get motivated. But if the Lord wants me to do something, then it's like, oh, I'm doing it for him, so it makes it easier. So, you know, creating sound. I'd work on sound. And even this is sound. Now, I don't think you can break, you know, my arguments. I, I didn't put this out there for you to argue with. It's out there for you to share in the dealing, in the, in the process, which I am going through as well, of trying to figure this thing out. I just get this thing of imminent danger, red flag, okay? So being forewarned is forearmed. And if you got lots of plans in this life and lots of things you want to do and all that, um, you may put it in the context that there is no guarantee to anyone's life, even in peaceful times. But what would it take for you to be able to die right now in peace? What it would take for me, I can tell you, is have a relationship with my God and to be in contact with my God and to be constantly crying, Abba, 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 God, talk to me, what's going on, like that just 24 hours, all day. To reassure me that indeed, um, you know, I may not comprehend his love and I, may, I also understand this thing of no respect to persons, but I really want to be right with him. From here on out, I gotta know that 24 seven. There, there just can't be any of this, you know, like a season here or this to drift and, you know, and whatever and try to reinterpret it or what. There is no reinterpretation of something that's true. There's just walking in that. And as my friend Johnny Kleck says, just now that you got that, just walk on out. Just keep walking in that through your days. The Lord will take care of us. He takes care of his children Every father takes care of his children. He takes care of his children. He's not going to take care of those who are not his children. Or if you want to make a joke out of it, well, he'll take care of them, but it won't matter, see, because in the end, there'll be no memory of anything like that because the book of Revelation says every tear will be dried, and that means that all the memory is wiped because they won't be real. And with that, I bid you shalom, shalom. Love you, praying for you, and I'll see you next time if there is a next time. Ah, there probably will be. Anyway, just watch the thing unfold. It's horrifying. It's terrible, terrible, terrible.